This is a Main Hustle Media Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Jackie O and you're listening to Militantly Mixed. Yo, this is Rashani from the Single Simulcast. And when I'm not making you laugh or making up parody songs, I'm kicking back listening to Militantly Mixed. I would like to acknowledge that the Militantly Mixed podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Chumash and the Tongva people, and I wish to pay my respects to the people of those nations, both past and present. Hey y'all, welcome to Militantly Mixed, the podcast about race and identity from the mixed race perspective. I am your host, Charmaine, aka Mixed Girl Maine, the busiest mixed race bisexual polyamorous atheist comic book nerd cat mom podcaster in this podcasting game this is episode 98 and i have no idea how i'm going to fit all this information in and get to the body of this episode but i'm gonna do my best because i don't want this thing to run too long first off announcements just a reminder we were going to go on hiatus for the last three weeks of july The July 7th episode is our second anniversary episode, and on that episode, I'm going to reflect over the last couple years. I'm going to share some clips and some notes that I've received from people over the last few weeks, and it's just going to be a celebration of everything that we've been able to accomplish through Militantly Mixed for the last two years. And then the final three weeks of July, I will go on hiatus and have a mental health break during those three weeks, and then we will come back in August, all refreshed and ready to go back to our normal episodes. I've been talking about the last couple of weeks that it's been kind of hard for me to focus on our regular episodes because of what was going on in the world and, you know, me feeling compelled to talk about those issues or talk about tools for the fight, basically. And so for the last three weeks, I've done solo episodes, which is not typical of Militantly Mixed, although I do do solo episodes from time to time. In a situation in which I have all the funding I need to produce this show at the level I would like to produce this show, I would have a mix of activism episodes and mixed race narratives. You know, it would be maybe a twice a week show in which I would do stuff like that. I've attempted it in times before, but since I still work full time and all this other kind of stuff, it's never quite worked out. But if I had my the funding that I would need to do that, that's what I would like to do. But since I can't, what I would like to do is mostly focus on the mixed race narratives of y'all that are gracious enough to share your stories with us so that um, other mixed folks in the world don't feel so lonely and underrepresented. But it's been hard to do that lately. I mean, I imagine for everybody, we're all kind of struggling in one way or another, trying to live our everyday life, be activists where we can, participate where we can, try to stay safe from COVID at the same time. You know, we do have a lot heaped up on us right now. And I just decided to take this time, this last couple of weeks to do these solo episodes. And I've been wanting to get back, but because of that distraction, because of that heaviness, I just couldn't focus. But I found a way to do that this week. This week's episode actually does bridge the gap between the solo episodes I've been doing for the last three weeks and going back to the mixed race narratives in, in a pretty clean way. My guest today is Dr. Jennifer Noble. She is a psychologist, a professor, and a mixed race advocate. And a lot of what we talked about does what I why I say bridges the gap between those two types of shows is we were talking about activism. We were talking about what's going on in the world through her story and talking as two mixed black women. So I think it's a good episode to pull forward to to drop today that still allows us to kind of stay on focus on on mission in terms of the the activism and the solo episodes, but also staying on mission for Militantly Mixed, which is sharing the stories of other mixed race people. So it does both of those things, I think. Actually, Dr. Jen and I ended up talking for over three hours and we had finished our regular style episode, the kind of getting to know one mixed person episode. We had finished it entirely. And then we continued to talk afterwards and I just hadn't turned the record button off. And We ended up getting into a conversation about mental health because that is her profession. It's something I talk about a lot on the show in terms of my own mental health and and how pro taking care of your mental health I am personally. And we had a really good conversation 
about mental health. One that we wanted to get in, but I, you know, I know that I can't drop a three hour episode (laughs) for y'all and know that you'll finish to the end. So what I think I'm going to do here, I had originally planned on sharing the mental health discussion today, and then it didn't make sense because you won't know who Dr. Jen is yet. But since it was relevant to what's going on, I felt like, oh yeah, I'll share that bit. But we're going to hold on to that till next week. What we're actually going to do today is we're going to meet Dr. Jen, hear her story, her mixed race experience. And then next week, when we come back, we'll do the part two, if you want to call it that, of our conversation, which was um, totally after we finished wrapping up this interview and just having a casual conversation about mental health. So we'll share that bit next week. And then the following week will be our second anniversary episode. And that'll be how we wrap up this part of Militantly Mixed before we take a break and go back into it in August. So before we meet Dr. Jen, a couple more announcements. We still have the Bell Project fundraiser going. So if you want to participate in that, it is the Militantly Mixed Bell Project Legal Defense Fund. We have set a goal of $2,000 and we are currently sitting at $1,429, I think. So I have a link to the show notes in that. It's also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So if you can donate, please do. Regardless of whether or not you donate, if you can share it, share that link wide so that we can hit that goal, because we want to take care of those frontline folks that get stuck in jail longer than they really deserve to be just because they're being arrested for protesting. If you don't realize that the protests are actually still actively going on in almost every major city, they're not being broadcasted about in the news because there's no more looting and the unrelated rioters and things. All of that has died down because those people tuckered out because they weren't a part of the movement. But the people that are part of the movement, the protesters are out there still every day. Even here in L.A. alone on Friday, Juneteenth, there was about 11 different rallies, marches or protests going on in the city all at the same time. It has not slowed down here at all. And from what I understand, it has not slowed down in other cities either. It's just not being broadcast on the news. So the Bell Project fundraiser is still very important because people are still getting arrested for exercising their right to protest and they might need our support. So that will be a link in the show notes. We still also have the Mixed and Hella Black t-shirt on our Teespring store, which is also a fundraiser t-shirt. The proceeds for that t-shirt go to Black Lives Matter, the global network. So if you're looking to get that shirt, they are starting to arrive. People are starting to get them. I have, um, mine actually came damaged and I've gotten um, a message from somebody else that theirs came kind of damaged too. So I'm reaching out to Teespring. I have reached out to Teespring. I'm waiting for them to respond about replacing those damaged shirts. But for those of you who are getting them and they're not damaged and they're totally wearable, uh, don't forget to tag Militantly Mix in your Instagram if you do post a picture of you wearing the shirt because I'm looking forward to seeing what y'all look like in the shirts. Mine looks good on the front. It's just got damage in the back. So, you know, whatever. I'll get a replacement and I'll start rocking that shirt out here soon too. Additionally, a way that we're, another way that we're trying to fundraise also with the Mixed and Hella Black t-shirt is I have a friend who has donated two t-shirts and a hoodie. And a friend of hers who has donated a t-shirt of Mixed and Hella Black to us to give away in a raffle. My friend Shay, who is a friend I've had since college, she is what I've referred to as my white woman whisperer on this show several times. She's the person who I sick on problematic white people who pop up in my life because she is on the Get Your People team. She is trying to correct white people from being racist as, as much as possible. She's doing it in her own platform and her own um, network, social network. And she's just been a major supporter of Militantly Mixed. Uh, and she loves the shirt, but since she's not mixed black, you know, she's not going to rock that shirt. So she wanted to donate some that we could, uh, we can give away to people who could benefit from them. But we, well, what I want to do is kind of do that as another way to raise money. So we're going to raffle the shirts off. And the way you purchase a quote unquote raffle ticket is if you go to paypal.me slash militantly mixed, which is the militantly mixed PayPal account and donate a minimum of $5, you will be entered to win one of the three t-shirts. Please make sure that your PayPal account has your, your full name, address and email address so that I can reach back out to you and send you the shirt once we get your size and everything. And if you want to enter, be entered to win the hoodie, you can do a minimum donation of $15. We only have three shirts and one hoodie to give away. The more money we raise, the more quote unquote raffle tickets that we give, we sell, quote unquote, (laughs) sell. 
uh, to folks, the more money we can raise for Black Lives Matter, and you might be able to win a t-shirt or a hoodie out of it. I announced this last Wednesday or Thursday, and then I did a terrible job of marketing this through social media throughout the week. And actually, it kind of makes sense that I talk about it on the show anyway, because not all of you are on social media. Some of you just listen to the show. So what we're going to do is we're going to extend this raffle. I originally said it was going to end on Monday, the 22nd, um, but we haven't received any donations because there's only been a couple posts about it so far, and it hasn't been talked about on the show yet. So what we're going to do is between now and next Monday, which is June 29th, we are going to hold this raffle. So you can start getting your donations into paypal.me slash militantly mixed, minimum of $5 for the shirts, minimum of 15 for the hoodie. And then I will go on IG Live next Monday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, and I will read off the winners. Um, I'll cut up the names, I'll stick it in a hat, and I will, I'll announce the winners uh, next week. So we're going to close the entries, I guess, at, say, 4 p.m. Pacific next Monday, the 29th, so that I have an hour to print out all the names and things, and I'll draw it from a hat on IG Live. And then we'll also talk about it. We'll announce it on next week's episode as well. So any opportunity that we have to raise funds for the Bell Project or Black Lives Matter or Know Your Rights campaign or, you know, I want to I want to try to make that possible through Militantly Mixed. So that's what we're doing right now. I also have the Militantly Mixed logo masks, the face masks that you can have right now, um, the cloth rewashable masks. If you go to the Instagram, you can see pictures of them. A few people have purchased them so far. I think I have about seven left, but I will order more fabric soon. So if you order them and I've run out, I will be getting more fabric in eventually so that I can send you out those masks. They are $10 a piece plus shipping and 50% of the proceeds goes to a charitable organization. Right now, our current organization is the Know Your Rights Campaign. The last batch of sales went to um, the Navajo Nation's COVID Relief Fund. And before that, it was also Know Your Rights campaign. Um, We had only raised $40 by that point. So I'd like to go try to get a little bit more of a donation together for Know Your Rights campaign. It's also their COVID-focused relief fund. And then the next batch will go to another organization. I'm vetting a few organizations and I'm kind of doing this in chunks of, say, $50 to $100 a piece, and then I move on to another charitable organization so we can spread out those funds as much as possible. I am hand making these masks. uh, So you can look at them on the Instagram so you can see what they look like. They're good quality. They're washable. They feel they're soft to the face. Um, It has the nose wire and the, the filter pocket. So it's a pretty good quality thing, something you can wear over and over again as needed, wash, wash and wear over and over again as needed. So those are all the ways that we are currently raising funds for various organizations. Please go to the show notes to check that out. And I think I managed to squeeze almost everything I wanted to talk about in before we meet Dr. Jen. Yeah. And if not, we'll get to it. We'll get back to it next week. There's there's a lot going on in the world. So don't want to overload anybody. Let's take a deep breath. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our latest cousin to the Militantly Mixed family, Dr. Jennifer Noble. And uh, all right, let's get into it. <laughs> Just like I said, I'm not smooth about it at all because we've already been talking for 10 minutes. But uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and let everybody know who you are and let's get into it. All right. So, yeah, I am Jennifer Noble and otherwise I am a psychologist. So I go by Dr. Jen in my professional world or, and I also teach. So I'm a psychologist, I'm a college instructor, and I am also a mixed race advocate. Um, for gosh, we don't need to count the years, do we? we can just- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Our existence <laughs> is uh, yes. lifelong ad- advocacy, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm young at heart, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's, uh, I'm a mixed race advocate and um, I identify as Black and Tamil Sri Lankan. So are you uh, like first or second generation American born or how does it work in your family? Yeah. I was born in Santa Monica. Um, I'm born and raised in Cali. I'm a Cali girl for life. But I would also say I'm first generation because my mother is an immigrant. So I have a similar thing. Well, I'm, I guess, technically second generation, but I was raised by my grandmother. So it feels like first generation, you know, that kind of thing happens. Yeah. Where it's right, like you're right. both of, you're p- both like sixth or seventh generation American and American born and first generation at the same time, mm-hmm. and that's kind of our experience. That's interesting. So let's let's get into it a little bit. Uh, what mm-hmm. is your? So I don't often. It's happening a little bit more often now mm-hmm. than than it had in the beginning of the show. I don't often get to connect with other Black and South Asian or Black and yeah. Asian identified folks, yeah. and so I'm getting to explore part of my mixed heritage that I really haven't been able to touch before because I'm pretty much hierarchically mixed. I'm black first, even though I present the way that I do ambiguously. And then I'm Japanese. And then, you know, I acknowledge that I'm mixed with white, though I have very little white experience. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But now I'm, I'm able to kind of like be a black and ease person a little bit more right. because I'm engaging more with other, with other black Asians. Awesome. But the black yeah, and a- South Asian experience is also a lot different from anything yeah. that I've experienced yeah. as well. So, yeah, I mean, well, that's what actually was really exciting when I found your podcast. I was like, Oh my gosh. Like, you know, for me, I, I would just put the category Blasian since, you know, like you said, you know, Japanese versus South Asian, very different mm-hmm. experiences. Although there might be some, you know, a lot of crossovers, right, right. But, but it's just really, you know, you, I don't often get to meet a lot of people that are black and Asian, black and South Asian, but, you know, as you kind of said, it, I living here. And it, again, if people end up seeing my picture or whatever, they'll see like my phenotype is like, if I walk down the street, everybody just sees a black woman. And so right. since I'm a child, um, that's just how everybody's always interacted with me. And, you know, society has treated me that way. So then I, I just very strongly identify as a black woman, like, you know, social life, friendship, all that kind of stuff is I just live a very black life. And, and mm-hmm. that, but at the same time, I've always, I've lived as a black woman, but I've never, you know, everybody that knows me knows I'm also Sri Lankan. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they right. you just, if you know me, you're going to know that too. And so they've been exposed to that. And hear me talk about it and it's not because I'm like uh by the way I just want you guys to know that you know it's just like it just is what it is and if you hang out and you meet my mom Mm -hmm. well then you're just you're just gonna know so um I would have to probably either rank it or hierarchically kind of list it but Mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily think about it that way it's just you know I am a black woman and I'm a black woman that's mixed like that's the kind of way that I would you know, think about it. And that's kind of how I experience it. Because even in spaces that are South Asian, because of my phenotype, I'm still seen as a black woman, even though they might, you know, even though they're accepting me into the space, they're still like, oh, look, there's the black woman that's also, you know, like Mm. one of us. Oh, that's (laughs) interesting. That's kind of how I think I get received, which is fine with me. But um it's just, so that's why I, I'm just saying that that's why I end up, I guess, leading with the Black woman experience because it right. is the strongest for me. And it might have been different if I grew up in Sri Lanka or if I grew up somewhere else. I don't know. But it, it probably may not have been just simply because I really just think phenotype has such a big influence. Such a big influence, yeah. You know, so, yeah. It's interesting, too, because... Uh, you know, my experience, I think, is a little bit unique from from some folks because my facial features do scream out from a mile away. This girl is mixed with black, um, mm-hmm. it, at least in terms of black folks, you know, mm-hmm. um, yes, right. white, white folks right. and, and non black POCs might struggle with it. But like black uh-huh. folks from a mile away will tell that I'm black, although my skin doesn't code that way. And, and my skin mm-hmm. is clearly telling a story. So. Mm-hmm. When black folks encounter me on the street, you know, strange strangers to me will say, you mixed or what, what, what else they got in you, yes. letting me know they know. 
Whereas right. in your experience, like they do, they're loading the black first. They might be able to detect that you're clearly missing. Yes, no, so they been, might still ask what they, what else they got up in you. <laughs> absolutely. No, I always talk about that because, um, especially when it's like a black other mix, I always talk about how like black people will say, what are you mixed with? Because they're like, you know, they're kind of like saying, I already know you're black, but mm-hmm. what else is in there? And so I do get that question. Like, what, what are you mixed with? You mixed yeah. with something? Like, Can I ask looking. you, how do you feel about that question? Because I know like if a white person says, what are you? Mm. And, or, or a non-black person, basically, because this is, this is the actual yeah. experience for me. If a non-black person says, what are you? I am triggered because, mm. you know, the audacity of, of being mm. able to ask the question the way that they ask it. Mm. Whereas like a black person never says, what are you? They say, right. what, are, what else are you? So like, right. they let you know that they are acknowledging and validating your blackness. And yeah. so when I get that question from black folks, I, I have a peace with it. Like I, I'm just like, oh, thank you for acknowledging and validating what you see. Now I'm more open to, to sharing with you. Is that, how is your experience of that? Um, yeah, I, I think, I'm trying to think if other people ask me, for, it all, it's, for me, it's more about like tone and um, mm. your facial expressions and stuff. Because I think sometimes from Black folks, there is a chance they could be negative if they're just sort of mad about that's whatever. true yeah so that could I, happen i just think it's really rare but sometimes if i get that tone of like what do you mix with you know like oh okay well you're you know i don't know like some, something is bothering you but I, i'll still answer but i it doesn't i don't need to get into anything but i can just tell okay you didn't really mean that in any type of way other than negative and you're trying to you know you're making sure i know that but most of the time it's just out of curiosity. And so I'm just, I'll just answer and let them, you know, like do whatever they need to do with it. I don't get as many questions from other folks. Like mm-hmm. honestly from it's, it's, let's see. It's definitely no white person in the really? history of my existence has ever, no. Um, See, they, this is such, such a weird thing about having a mixed lens, I think, is it surprises me when, yeah. like, that statement, you saying no white person, I'm I, like, but your face is telling me multiple just, stories. Because you know what? I just feel like most, I, I'm really trying to rack my brain to see if I can remember someone who is not like of the African diaspora, right? Because I'm saying Mm -hmm. like Ethiopians or other Africans will ask me, um, you know, Afro-Latinos will ask me. I I have not, I have not been asked by anybody who is, I really don't think, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm just still like, yeah, no one who is, is like, white i would even east asian um i have maybe been asked by some south asians because south asians might look at me but see south asians don't really ask anyway they just stare right which is like their you know way of answering their own question but they don't (laughs) they don't realize that that (laughs) i can see you staring at me but i don't (laughs) it's not a fact now that i I mean because i know the culture so i'm just like I, I know you're struggling, so I'll just let you keep looking until you decide. And maybe if we end up talking, you might ask me. And so mm. um, every once in a while, someone that is a little bit more outgoing South Asian might be like, so, you know, where, you know, kind of just ask whatever question. And then they can be like, oh, I knew it, you know, they'll because they're really asking because they detected it. Right. But no one else besides someone who is like brown themselves um, huh. has ever asked me because, again, I'm dark brown. I got curly hair. So they just see those two things, I think, or, you know, whatever. And they're just like, oh, I already know. I don't even need to think about it anymore. Like, I always laugh because a lot of my friends, um, you know, black people can still get tan. Like, if you're dark, you still get darker. Right. And um, black people can see when other, like, my friends can see when I've been somewhere on the beach for days and, like, I got darker. And they're like, oh, look at you. You got a tan. Like, you know, like kind of we make jokes about, oh, I see, you know, whatever. Um, but I had some friends and, and they they were white. They're from the South. Mad cool people, but they could not tell. Like we had a whole conversation with them and 
and we had to like teach them how to see that the brown got browner or like the brown wow. got more. it was and then finally we we had given them all these different examples over some months and then i went on another trip and they came back and we were like hey like we're i was trying to talk to them like you notice anything and then they're like oh, i see it you you got you you got a tan you, you know oh my oh my gosh. <laughs> like so obvious wow but, yeah you know, that's honestly, that's why I think a lot of white folks will come up and say things like, oh, you look just like, I don't know. I was going to just, yeah. Actress. And you're like, that actress is like seven shades lighter or right. four shades darker or like, I know I do not look like, I don't know, Beyonce, because they're just like, brown is one brown. I think, the one brown. Know? Yeah. And that's like how you can cast it in a movie a light-skinned child that grows up to be a dark-skinned adult yeah. and you're just like huh you know like that's yeah, like that. is it true that like you can have three dark kids and a light kids if if you give birth to them yeah that's genetics yes. are weird but you don't grow up to be <laughs> right <laughs> you don't a change dark, like right. that <laughs> exactly oh my gosh yeah, that's also that's always something that frustrates the hell out of me. And to try to explain that to white people, like why you're frustrated by how they casted brown yeah, skin like, people. I think they look alike. I think and you're like, do you not see that? Right. Like you almost get confused in the story. Like, wait, is that is that the daughter now? Oh right. You have to explain to me why that light skinned kid turned into a dark skinned adult or or vice versa. Like Or vice versa, right. It's so wild that that happens. Uh you said something that actually kind of sparked my brain. You said you said the um, not being able to de uh, detect the brown or something, the the change in the in the skin, and mm -hmm. I am really curious how, like mentally, like how does that happen in people? Like how do they? I mean, in the same way that you can say that, like you can confuse Samuel Jackson or they can confuse Samuel Jackson with Lawrence Finchburn in a movie. While right. they're interviewing him for a movie, <laughs> right. Um, right? And and they really are just baffled by like, why do you think we look the same? Um, it made me yeah. think about Asians and South Asians having this yeah. same type of thing. You know, like in the same way that Black people can detect that we are Black and maybe mixed. Also, I find that Asians, if they do think you're Asian, in my mm -hmm. case, they think I'm Filipino because Filipinos mm -hmm. are the mixed Asians anyway. Yeah, um, right, right. But they never see. Even though my skin tone and the shape of my eyes and things like that code like a mixed Asian, or at least to me, I think they never detect Asianness. Oh, is really? that similar on the South? Because I know like South yeah. Asians are used to a, a wide variety of skin tones. Yeah, like you yeah. see, you know, they have very, very, very dark skinned people that are, you know, yes. Yes. Pla practically Sudanese dark, yes. and then you have the the lighter skinned Asians as well. But yeah, like, do they? Sure. So you say like, let's say maybe uh, a Pakistani or Indian person would look yeah. at you and go like, okay, you're probably South Asian, but where do they, do they get that? Like, I know they're not asking you, but do you think there is yeah. something like that happening where they're trying to detect, they're acknowledging the South Asian is, yeah. but trying to figure out where, but, and because yeah. you're mixed, that's the reason why they can't tell. Yeah. I think sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't notice it or, or, you know, ask at all. But I do think because I think the, the skin color, um, and then some of my facial features, they might, it might just grab mm. their eyes enough where they're just like, wait. Um, and so that's when they'll want to come and ask. But I think most of the time, if they don't, I, I'm not sure if it's like, if they aren't looking that closely or if nothing just kind of sparks for them, they sort of just um, cause the skin color is not the piece, the skin, like you said, right. skin color would be like, okay, yeah, you could totally be one of us, but I think it's the curly hair. Cause mm -hmm. I, I just had a haircut, but, um, I used to have like really big curly hair and, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'd wear it out a lot. So there are lots, actually in Sri Lanka, there's a lot of people with big frizzy curly hair. Mm -hmm. Um, but still even mine is more coarse. And so I think the hair is what makes them say, ah, no, you know what I mean? Mm. Like so they might see the skin color. Well, also my, you know, maybe my body shape, but I think if they were soft, a couple facial features, but when they see the hair, they're like, oh yeah, probably not. But, mm. um, a few, like I said, a few will kind of come up and they'll sort of ask the kind of roundabout questions like, Oh, what, you know, if like, let's say if I'm at a, I don't know, um, Indian film festival or something, maybe somebody will be talking with me and they're like, 
what made you decide to come to the Indian? Oh, yes, I see. Yeah. <laughs> coded, real coded question. <laughs> yeah. So then I could, you know, or whatever it is. Like, I remember I was taking um, South Asian, South Indian dance, uh, classical South Indian dance. And so I, you know, we had recitals, we had performances, I'm, you know, going to different classes. And so it's a lot of like little Indian kids, some of them are mixed, some of, you know, teenagers and adults. And um, every once in a while, the parents, that see me regularly and feel comfortable enough to chit chat with me, then they'll kind of be like, so what made you want to take these classes? And then I'll say, you know, Oh, well, because it's a dance from my culture. Like I'm Sri right. Lankan Tamil. And we're like, Oh, like, and then you can see there's like answering three other questions. They right. Have. Right. <laughs> what about if you're standing next to your parents? Like if you're, what do people see it more depending on if you're standing next to a one parent over the other or both? No, if I'm with my dad, they just think I'm black. You're just black, yeah. I look very much like my dad. Um, and then if I'm don't we mom, all? <laughs> I look just <laughs> like my dad too. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's never. I just you know we just look like a black family if I'm with my dad. But then if I'm with my mom, um, they probably just don't even. Sometimes they're like, "Oh, are you two together?" I'm like, uh, yeah. Like, oh, you know. like what made you two? hang out yeah. of all two people on the right. planet you, you must be having a lovely lunch with this stranger today yeah i am yeah and how <laughs> is your I skin am. tone related to your mother's skin tone mom is like um i'd say she's like i'm trying to think like uh, peanut butter color maybe and okay i'm like i'm like you're dark cinnamon. Cinnamon. okay yeah. i always yeah. wonder because um with with biracial folks that aren't where one parent isn't white. I, we hear the story a lot of like, if they're, if they're next to their white parent, it's just like, are you, oh, it's so kind of you to adopt this little brown child. You, you know, you're a hero. And if yeah. they're with their brown parent, it's just like, um, are you the nanny? You know, like, are, are you the, the daycare person to this, yeah. you know, light-skinned biracial mm-hmm. child maybe. But for those of us that have parents that aren't white mm-hmm. and, we're, and we're mixed race, like, I wonder, I, I don't know often, because I look, I have my dad's face and my mother's coloring. So, like, if I, st- if I was standing next to my dad, there's no question. There's no yeah. way to say that this, I am not this man's child. Um, right. But if I'm standing next to my mom, the only time I look like her is if, actually, I'm darker than my mom, but uh, the only right. time I look like her is if she's angry and I'm angry. We have the same oh. anger face, but we don't oh, have anything crazy. else that we share. You know, oh, like... That's- no one can ever tell I'm her daughter. Besides the fact that she's she's a lot paler, she looks a little bit more white than than mm-hmm. Japanese, and uh, sometimes mm-hmm. she dyes her hair blonde. So like, there's nothing oh, that is making us related unless she has her natural color. Then maybe you know. Yeah. But I'm built like my I'm built like the women on my dad's side of the family. I'm and though mm-hmm. light skin, I I look just like him. So there's no question there. But I wonder how it is for other mixed race folks whose parents are two different kinds of brown like what are the questions be- because there's no like oh you honorable white person who adopted these poor poor oh, brown right. children yeah. you know like what is the thing that happens to us yeah. when people see us that they don't communicate yeah, but you know they're thinking I, I don't think it's i think you're right they don't they can't jump to like adoption or maybe well some i'm sure some probably still get adoption and nanny depending on how different the phenotype is you know like maybe if you're let's say if you're like a Mexican American mom and your child, you know, it's like your child is Mexican and black, but they just look more, you know, phenotypically black. Um, maybe there might be questions of like, I don't know, you know, are you. They'd probably just assume they were kidding? Dominican. You, yeah. Or yeah, maybe could be, but I, I don't know, but I, I don't think, yeah, there's probably not like a go-to kind of more insulting question like that it's probably just mm-hmm. more like are you together because but i don't really know i used to just get a we just got a lot of oh oh you're together oh you too you know that kind of thing i don't think my mom ever got a are you the nanny did you mm-hmm. adopt none of that it was just oh that's your mom oh that's your daughter like that you know mm-hmm. just like yeah. oh i had my brain couldn't put you two together and i've been trying to figure out why <laughs> you, you know <laughs> Why on earth are you, of all people? Yeah. What, what did you understand about yourself growing up? Like, you knew you had two different kinds of brown parents and everything, but mm-hmm. did it make mm-hmm. sense to you? 
it made sense to me. I mean, yeah. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, to me, it the, was like, I, yeah. Uh, the the reason why I ask is because I find that throughout this experience with militantly mixed is that there's some people who didn't get it like mm-hmm. they they're just existing right that's like their parents are their parents and there's the only time it became obvious is when an outsider said hey right. your parents are yeah. different from you you know that kind of thing yeah um, so yeah. I kind of wonder like in terms of when you when you realized you were mixed and as a child did you understand it like did you understand what people meant if they addressed you about it which they may not have (laughs) yeah I think it was more like I I was made aware that my it was more like oh I'm from a different culture like because I would have a friend you know like friends come over in the neighborhood and I, I still remember one day one of my friends came over and she was like, you know, a little white girl that lived in the neighborhood. But um, mm-hmm. when she came in, you know, we take our shoes off. So she's like taking her shoes off. She's like, I always love the way your house smells. And I was like, what? Like, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. But she really was like so serious. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, my house has no smell. I'm like, I don't understand what she's talking right. about. But it, you know. I think then she, and she was like, yeah, it always smells so good or something. And I was like, huh. And I think that was the first time I was like, oh, we're different. Like mm. my house, my house smells different. So that means your house doesn't smell like this and people's houses smell different from each other. And, right. you know, so I think there must've been some point when I then went to family's house and like, when of course when I go in their home and we're having a meal or something I I walk in and I smell it but I'm smelling what I already know and I'm like oh yay like yeah food is really but yeah, right right after that I finally realized like oh people don't know this smell like they don't they don't cook curry and so I guess right. they don't know like rice and curry smells like so I think I had to put those together like what do you mean my house has a smell and then I'm like oh I guess, you know, it definitely lingers and I liked the smell, but I sure. smelled it so much that I never. Yeah. You were nose blind to it. Yeah. Your, I never, yeah. Your experience. Um, I didn't come home like, ah, oh, the smell of my home, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> my people. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know? right. So um, stuff like that, like little things like that would make me realize like, okay, not every, not everybody's mom is like my mom. Mm-hmm. Not everybody eats like we eat. Um, like I would go to someone else's house and like immediately go in and like take my shoes off and they'd be like, you don't have to take your too. shoes off. Yeah, like, I do it too. Oh. I'm like, but I'm indoors. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I'm in the house. Are you going to walk <laughs> to your bedroom in my shoes? Like, yeah. are you sure? I remember the first time I went to a white kid's house and they told me I could sit on their bed and I was like, but I'm in my outside clothes. <laughs> you know, and that being something that just sparked a conversation of like, they had no clue what I was talking about and I had no clue what they were talking about. Yeah. And there was no way to bridge that gap. You know, there was no way to explain to the other one. Cause we didn't know what we were dealing with in that moment right. of just like, this right. is a very cultural thing. You don't sit on your bed with the outside clothes. And, and I, I don't even think I didn't even get um, words like that. I would just, as soon as we got home, we would always just change. Yeah. And I, I never knew, I never really thought about why or when, but I remember right. months later on and I would come home and change my clothes. And I remember somebody saying, why do you always change your clothes as soon as you get home? I'm like, what? Because I'm indoors, like, because that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, like, am I just supposed to stay in the same clothes? That's weird. That doesn't yeah. even make sense. Why would you wear the same clothes that you wore all day, all night? Right. But Yeah. That's like wild. even because I, I married my, my husband's half Palestinian, half white, but he grew up okay. predominantly white, except for all his friends were black. So his household was white, but his friends were black. Um, okay. And he there's times when he'll he'll stay at home and he'll like stay in his clothes and stay in his shoes. And I'll be like, take off your shoes, stay a while. Like <laughs> what? Like it makes it, it used to make no sense to me that he didn't yeah. immediately get comfortable, like take off his shoes out the door and immediately get into, comf- you know, home clothes. Basically, yeah. I didn't understand it. it. It was years. Now he does it mostly. He still will leave his shoes on and things like that. Mm-hmm. But 
now mm. he does it mostly and but there's no cultural context to it it's just like this is just the thing that we do now you know yeah. kind of a thing whereas for me it was it wasn't until meeting people that were different from me that i realized that this stuff was cultural you know like yeah. that that the shoes like i understood the shoe thing was in, in terms of japanese households was um you're honoring the household um you don't oh. want to drag the outside inside um yes, and right. it, okay, it's yeah. it's like yeah. a form of respect to the house and uh and so like that that was a lesson so it's something yeah. i definitely understood the clothing yeah. thing i didn't that was just what we did mm-hmm. so yeah. i didn't understand until talking to other kids who also grew up in cultures that were similar and this mm-hmm. was actually something that crossed over from the black side and the Japanese side. It was like, both of us do this, but white mm-hmm. kids didn't. And I didn't know that because I didn't even, mm-hmm. I didn't even hang out with white kids. I didn't even get to start knowing white kids until I was about 15. Mm-hmm. That's interesting because I, even still, I think probably to this day, if I go visit my dad, I'll walk in and I'll take my shoes off. And sometimes he'd be like, you don't have to take your shoes off. Like he, he's more wear his shoes in the house kind of guy. Mm. And, and I've all, ever since I was young, I'd be like, that doesn't, I doesn't feel right to be in your house and take and keep my shoes on. It doesn't, on. it doesn't. Unless he has a bigger, um, like, you know, argument with me to keep them on that kind of mm-hmm. thing, then I will just ignore his, don't worry about that. Cause he thinks, he thinks it's putting me through some trouble to take my shoes off. Right. And I'm like, I don't want to be rude and keep them on. Right. So it's like, he's trying to be nice to me and I'm trying to be nice to him. But, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, 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 I got it. Let me just take them off. It's fine. That's funny. So, so yeah. in my, in my case, the one thing I haven't done that I haven't dragged in from the Japanese culture is having a variety of different size house shoes for people to oh put gosh, when they yeah. come home. So like, that's right. not something I've crossed over into, although it's something yeah. I think about all the time. I don't yeah. often have guests though. So that's the other justification is like, I don't invite people over. So, but if that's I do, I am, I'm always like, I'm sorry, I don't have any shower shoes. Well, we call them shower shoes, but I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I like, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't have shower shoes for you is my, yeah. is my, the way I think as soon as I have someone coming in the house. Whereas I don't realize that unless they're Japanese too, that they're like, okay, why would I have shower shoes? You know? Right. Wow. That will, right. okay, that's my culture. I didn't realize, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Is I have a cousin that, well, they don't, none of, I don't really think it's common for um, Sri Lankan homes to like provide you with other shoes, but they certainly will have like a whole bunch of flip flops by all different doors because mm-hmm. if you're going to step outside, then you put those on. You put those on. To, you know, mm-hmm. Yeah. To go outside into the backyard or go out to do whatever. And then you take them off and, you know, maybe there's some, they, there may be some flip-flops you wear in the house, but most of the time you're just going to be wearing, you know, your barefoot or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I've noticed like a lot of my black peers, their version is going to have like a big, like maybe the more like bougie black folks, folks I hang out with, they're going to have like a big basket of socks by the door. And so you come ah. over, you take your shoes off. And then you get to put on some socks because, you know, maybe you feel some type of way about being barefoot or maybe it's floors and your feet might get cold. So there's, Mm. um, so, so sometimes friends will come over to my house and if I'm, you know, they see all the shoes by the door. So they'll be like, Oh, you want me to take my shoes off? I'm like, yeah, if you don't mind, that'd be great. And so a few of them will be like, do you have any socks? And I'm like, sure. So I'll go grab some socks and give it to them to wear. I've never heard the sock thing. Yeah. It's like, you know, I'm not, they're not, I shouldn't say bougie, but they are kind of bougie. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely have a weird thing about like bare feet to surfaces. Mm. Thing. So if I yeah. if I am wearing flip flops or something like that, which is what shower shoes are, but we call them shower mm-hmm. shoes at home. It's so funny because if I wear them outside, they're flip flops. Mm-hmm. If I wear them right, outside, right, they're shower yeah. shoes. <laughs> sure. um, uh, but like I, so I definitely have that issue. So on the rare occasions that I'm out there wearing uh, flip flops in the world, and I go to somebody's mm-hmm. house. Mm. I will struggle with what I'm going to do <laughs> like, uh, I see, because I, I want to take, I mean, I'm compelled to take my shoes off in the house, but I don't want to have my naked bare feet on a surface um, like that. So I would yeah. definitely struggle with that. Yeah, I have a lot of friends that, and, and like I said, like a lot of my black people would just be like, no, there's no qualms. Like, Hey, do you have any socks? And I'm like, sure. So like I said, I used to go and buy, like just buy cheapy, you know, yeah. ankle no, socks, like that. big packs of them and just keep them by the door, especially if I was having like a big lunch and, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, potluck type of thing, have everybody come over and then 
everybody, you know, rocks the shoot socks and then right. they take them off before they go and you're good. That's, that's actually kind of awesome. I might apply that. I, I have <laughs> warned people like this is a, like, this is a, a Japanese house. So like, make sure mm-hmm. that you don't have holes in your socks. I've done, <laughs> I've done that to folks before. That's yeah. Funny. What about in terms of culture or upbringing? Like, did you have access to language? I obviously food was a part of it, but did you mm-hmm. have access to language? And did you was dance only a part of your adulthood, or was that also a part of your childhood? Yeah, dance came later. Well, classical Indian dance came later. I grew up taking dance, so my mom um, she put me in ballet and like you know a couple other things. So I I grew mm-hmm. up from pretty young taking all different types of. Um, I guess more European dance classes, right? And then later in my college year or past college years, so yeah, somewhere in my college-ish after years, um, mm-hmm. I started getting interested um, in classical Indian dance. I had a really good friend from college, and um, she was South Indian. We we were still super close, and she. Grew up taking South Indian dance, Bharatanatyam specifically, and she, you know, would sometimes show us some stuff or I would be in, you know, in college, we were like part of the like Indian Student Association or whatever, mm. or South Asian Student Association and do some little performances and stuff. So she would like teach us and I'm like, man, I wish I could learn, that. you know, like kind of tease my mom, like, how come you didn't put me in this type of dance? Right. But <laughs> where we lived, it was like predominantly white neighborhood there was no I don't even know how she would probably find those classes we'd have to probably drive really far right um so yeah so somewhere after college then I was like I'm gonna find a teacher and you know I started searching and then I found this school out here in LA and so I joined that you know who was taking classes with the little kids and Mm -hmm. just be like don't worry about this adult over here I'm I'm learning the same thing you are I, that's how I want to do. I want to do taiko drums eventually. It's something I've wanted oh, to do wow. forever. And every time I look into classes, they're predominantly for younger I kids. Know. But it was just one of those things. Like in, in terms of my grandma, my jet, my mom's side of the family, uh, my mom was a teen mom. So and I was black. Mm-hmm. So like there were so many oh. reasons why I wasn't allowed to be a member of the Japanese community at large. I was only mm-hmm. allowed to be Japanese in my grandma's house. And so I didn't get to do a lot of the things that other Japanese kids yeah, got to do. Right, right. And so I did feel that disconnection to that culture. And I, I it, but it's one of those things that the second I hear, I feel like that's the primal part of me is the second I hear mm-hmm. taiko drums or, or I hear African, drum, West African drums, um, mm-hmm. my whole body is affected by that, right. um, by that music. And so yeah. I, I want to find, I have been able to trace where in Africa my father's family descends from and stuff. So I'm looking into music, you know, directly from those cultures and stuff like that. But eventually, I don't know when this eventually is. I'm 42 years old. God damn it. Like eventually I want to be doing that. Like take those jump classes. Yeah. Yeah. I've done some West African dance before, but I, um, Mm -hmm. I have like, I have a knee injury and I can't keep it up for too long, too long. Yeah. 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 Did you feel, I understand walking through the world as a black woman because of Mm -hmm. presentation and and experience Mm -hmm. and things like that, but are there moments when you're just Sri Lankan as fuck, (laughs) for lack of a better term? Like, do you feel those moments ever? Yeah, I think so. Um, What are some moments where I feel like that? I don't know. It could be just like really small things, like Mm -hmm. just the way honestly this is going to be seem this may seem really random but or i guess maybe these Not are with this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't it's think like so. <laughs> little little things that make me realize like oh shoot i do a lot of things like in a very sri lankan way like even just tasting food when i'm cooking it because mm. um mm. i remember I was over at some friend's house and, um, you know, African-American friends and they're cooking and we're all having like a big lunch and they were like stirring and they're like, okay, let me see how this tastes. And so they would like go to the drawer, grab a spoon, dip the spoon in the thing. And then, you know, like try it and then put that spoon to the side and be like, okay, it needs more of this, needs more of that. Then they like grab another spoon. And I remember standing there like, you about to use up all your spoons, but what are you doing? (laughs) And, and then it, for me, uh, so then I remember 
I, so I'm just thinking like, this is, this, something seems wrong. Like how do you use all these utensils just to taste your food? I and, but what I would do and what all my, like, it, it takes you a while to realize like, oh, this is mm-hmm. what we do. This is what mm-hmm. you do. So like my auntie, my mom, like, and then I have, um, again, I was at another friend's house, but she's, um, she's from Canada, but she's, her family's Indian and she was cooking something. And she's in the kitchen and she's like, okay, let me just check. And so she took the spoon that she was stirring with, like the big stirring spoon. Mm-hmm. She picked up some of the sauce and then she put it on the middle of the palm of her hand and then tasted her hand. Oh. And I was like, I was like, thank you. And she, was like, <laughs> and I was like, she was like, what? What's the problem? I was like, that's how I do it. And I was like, I thought, I'm like, now, okay. I was like, I knew it wasn't just me. I was like, I was like, this clearly is a cultural thing. Like, it's not just me and my mom and my aunties or whatever. I'm like, because I don't know why. Maybe it's because you're just like, you don't have that many spoons in the home or something. Like, right. class or class and, you know, country of origin and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's how we do it. Like, you put it a little bit on your hand. And I, I feel like there's probably a lot more um, countries that might do that, but maybe not. But I just know in that moment, I was like, this is so different. That's such like, a moment. Yeah. I think those those moments, like you said, those random moments are are something that, you know, it's it's kind of like. Uh, so I live in uh, the Sawtelle area of, of LA, which mm-hmm. is predominant. Okay. It's what they refer to, even though I hate it, Little Osaka. Uh, well, oh. the white the white folks do. Okay. <laughs> we call it, we, yeah. we, don't, <laughs> we don't call it. But I so I'm finally for the first time like in a Japanese neighborhood or something okay. that has a lot of Japanese access. And I will walk past or, you know, I'm down by the restaurants or, or by the Buddhist temple. I'm not Buddhist, but they have a, events there, you know, the mm-hmm. major Japanese festivals there. And so we'll go down there for that. And there are these moments when, you know, like, like you said, you're just, you're just living your life and you don't realize that in this moment, this is like a very telling thing about how Japanese I am, you know, like how much Japanese got in there in my childhood, um, mm-hmm. you know, it is the sound of the takeo drums or, you know, pronouncing it skiaki and not sukiyaki or, you know, something like that, like hearing the way someone says something or the fact that like, if I'm in the presence of Af- other Japanese, my physical body change it. Like I hunch over, mm-hmm. I start to, I start to um, talk in a very, like, depending on the age of the person I'm speaking to, yes, my, right. my tone and my, and things like that happen. And then as soon as I'm done with that conversation, my body straightens up and I didn't notice I was doing it, but my husband would notice, like we'd go to the grocery store and um, I would start making the sounds that are words that aren't translatable, you know, like the things that we know Mm, is sound that the sounds that we make as Japanese folks that actually translate into a meaning, Um, you know, I would be doing those things with the cashier. And then I'd walk out and my body would straighten up and I'd stop doing it. And he would start laughing. He was like, you just, physically code switched like right. your body code switched for you and you just yeah. like but it's those moments of just like when somebody also just let me you know not let me but you know like that they yeah. didn't go what are you doing you know like that right. they actually they just yeah. they felt like oh she she's clearly from this too um yeah it, it, you know, that it's that, thank you. It's like that. Oh, I'm, I'm of this also, you know, yeah. these moments I'm of this also moments that I, I didn't ever get to experience in my Japanese-ness before. So I'm like trying mm. to experience, not trying to experience, I'm getting an opportunity, I guess, to experience that kind of stuff now mm-hmm, based mm-hmm. off the neighborhood that I live in. Because most of my life I've lived in predominantly black spaces and, mm-hmm. and unless somebody tells me I'm not black in their view, I forget that I'm light skin, honestly. Um, okay, right. you know, like I just don't exist. Mm-hmm. My, my visual of myself as a person is like, even though none of this is how I look a dark skinned person with an Afro and my fist up in the sky, like <laughs> that is the image that I feel I am. But then I look in the yeah. mirror and I'm like, oh yeah, I have sh- half straight, half curly hair with, <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, you know, kind of yellowy tan skin. Like I forget that I look like that. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, but That's these funny. moments like, so that the hand tasting, I, I, I love, I love that that is a thing that is just a moment that didn't blow past you. You know, like it's, it's a moment of, I mean, I feel like as mixed people, sometimes we do need validation, even though we don't know why we need it, but there's these, like these real, real moments that just remind you of like all of these things that you're mixed with, all of these cultures, all of these languages, all of these foods, all of these dances. 
Like they're all in here and you don't often get, you don't get to walk around with them at all times. They're not at play at all times. And so to have those kind of moments, um, like uh, for, for in terms of like those small random ones, one that I got is that I was eating Cheetos cheese puffs with chopsticks because Uh. I don't want to get my hands dirty when I'm eating my food. I don't want to keep putting my hand in the bag with something that's that cheesy. Right. I didn't know that that was a Japanese thing. I didn't understand that other Japanese people did it. It was just, it made sense to me to yes, use right. chopsticks to, the to do this. The principle behind it is why right. we did it. And not, with not how we do things. eat our bag snacks, like we do do oh. that. Um, and so like I was just translating an American item. Yes. I was, right. you know, I was using Japanese technique for an American item. And then Oscar Isaac, the actor who's not Japanese, okay. was eating Cheetos with chopsticks on an Instagram live and the world exploded. Like, oh my God, I can't yeah. believe he's doing it. But Japanese people were like, what, what is the surprise thing that's happening? Like, we didn't understand that it was an unusual thing to other people. And so, like, in that moment, I had this weird solidarity with Japanese people. (laughs) Yeah, that's (laughs) Of just like, oh, this is this thing that we do. The only thing that bothered me was that Isaac Oscar was not, or Oscar Isaac, I don't remember which first name is his real first name. Right, I don't, right. I just didn't like, why are you doing that? Basically my question became, why is right. he doing that? Even why though it's not necessarily that? Yeah. something that my culture has to own. It's just a thing yes. of like, all right. Okay. So you're using chopsticks. Um, good on you, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so it's these weird yeah. moments that, that I think are really meaningful for us because we are confronted so often with not being enough of. And these are those moments that like, tell me I'm not enough of, <laughs> I just tasted my food on my hand. You know, like, <laughs> you know, tell right. me I'm not enough of, I just ate Cheetos with <laughs> chopsticks. <laughs> Right. The food thing is, is funny because, you know, I, you made me think of a time I, I went to this, this South Indian restaurant or this kind of, I, I wouldn't call it a restaurant, but it's an eatery. Like it's kind of okay. um, really cheap. You probably, I mean, it's, it's um, India sweets and spices on like Venice over there. So it's low cost okay. and um, but it's got tasty stuff. And so sometimes I'll go there and whatever. And I remember one time, um, you know, and we eat with our hands. So there's yeah. a, there's a way you're going to, uh, you know, tear the thosa and like dip it in stuff or whatever. And so mm-hmm. the guy, like one of the chefs, I guess, or the cooks that works there, he was like going back and forth and I guess throwing things and picking up stuff and whatever. And I'm just there eating and looking at my phone. Um, and he walked by and he was like, you're South Asian, aren't you? Or something like he, he, mm. Is that part of your culture? And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, how'd you know? And he was like, because I can tell by the way you're, you know, you're holding Mm. your fingers or something like that. And I was like, yes, Mm. you know, like someone had to teach me at some point because I remember being like, I would watch my family eat with their hands, like my aunts and uncles, because most of the time the kids would be given utensils or whatever. And I'd be Mm. like, mommy, I want to do that. Or, you know, so they'd kind of show me how to do it. And then you have to learn the little rules about where not to get the food and you can't use your left hand and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. So it's like, then when I see other people trying to eat food with their hands and they're, I'm just looking at them like, oh. <sighs> okay, yeah, I just, I think it's, um, there's something about like the family communal aspect that does definitely shift from like Western and then non-Western. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if it's super generalizable, but it, and I, I think it gets, just gets stronger in certain environments. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's, I mean, you know, everybody, we still come together around food, all the cultures and yeah. it still brings people together and still the connector, but like you're saying, in just like in so many different ways and mm-hmm. those subtle ways, like maybe people won't always notice, but you're going to feel it if, you know, if you, I'm certainly going to feel it if I go to a home where it's like, you know, a big black gathering, I'm going to deal with people and foods a little bit differently than if it's a Sri Lankan gathering and Mm. um, I might eat a little, you know, I'm certainly going to eat differently, but it's for the most part, I think I wouldn't feel so many differences with like, I mean, other than eating with my hands or not, you know, and then Mm, following all the rules around that. But I feel for me, Sri Lankans and Blacks, and in my experience, they're both cultures that are like 
really um, about, you know, celebration and coming together and like enjoying big, you know, Mm -hmm. gatherings where you're laughing and talking and eating and eating and eating and, you know, and then maybe you're drinking and dancing and eating some more. And um, so to me, there's a lot of um, similarity and crossover that, that you can bring those two groups together and it doesn't really, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of difficulty to bring them together because they handle those two things in, in a very similar way. Right. Like Sri Lanka for New Year's is, I mean, talk about parties. They're like known <laughs> for all night, literally all night dancing. And then you go so long that they serve, you go there, you pay for, I think you get dinner or maybe you eat before you go or whatever. But you're dancing, 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 and then they end the party with breakfast because that's how late it is. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so if you, I've had so many experiences now where I can bring my Black friends and my Sri Lankan friends together, and we all just go out and, like, everybody's dance. I've been to clubs in Sri Lanka. I've been to clubs out in L.A. I've been to clubs in D.C. I've been, you know, it's like the music and the dancing and, like I said, the drinking and the eating – Sri Lankans know exactly how to do that. And, mm-hmm. and so do black folks, you know, I don't always think that's true with maybe all of South Asian groups, but sure. But for sure, Sri Lankans can out, like can out party <laughs> most, <laughs> most Asians in there. I don't know. Maybe it's like the Island kind of maybe, vibe, yeah. you know, just makes them a little more livelier and like, and a little more open in my experience. Um, to just your people like it's just people come on let's have yeah. fun yeah there's other groups that are like a little closed off like well who are you i don't know you I don't right know you, you know that's fun uh, we are coming a little bit close to the end of the show though so i want to okay. ask the question that i like to ask all of my guests what do you love most about being mixed or multiracial yeah um i think what i particularly love about it is just just like you and I are talking about all these like nuances and you know small things that actually are really big at the same time I like that for me being mixed race makes me open to not open just it it kind of forced my eyes open to seeing these little things Mm. in so many other cultures as well or even Mm. just within the two that are a part of my own life like Sri Lankan culture and African American culture just always noticing all these little things it's like oh that's similar oh that's different oh that's almost the same but this happens and to me that deeper understanding and like using that nuance to kind of connect or Mm. um even explain or cross bridges and whatever. I I really, I think that's what I like best because it it just gives me this, I don't know, it feels like extra ability or sometimes I call it like a superpower to be able to just be like, like Mm -hmm. you said, like I know how to make these certain noises Mm -hmm. that are really not words, but they're going to convey yes. They're going to convey no. They're going to convey I'm interested in what you're saying Mm -hmm. um, because Sri Lankans have their own, you know, vocalizations just like blacks do. And I can do both of them with whoever I'm with that makes that I don't have to be able to, they don't have to question it and they can keep talking and they don't even notice that I made the, you know, vocalization because it just helped them along. So I like that kind of stuff. That's what I really appreciate. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me on the show. And I know that we've kind of like, dm'd each other um on instagram for a while um so to finally get together i I really appreciate it i hope you're taking care of yourself right now and everything (laughs) Mm -hmm. life is crazy do you want to share with anybody how they can find you yeah i can i'm on instagram at dr jen sykes so d-r-j-e-n-n p-s-y-c-h and it's pretty much the same everywhere so it's like twitter facebook um and then i have drjenpsych.com and then I have a therapy website too for people that are uh, you know looking for more private practice and therapy okay. and stuff but if you yeah. send me that link I'll, I'll put that in the show notes 
Honestly, that isn't even an area that we got a chance to touch, but hopefully maybe yeah, we can yeah. have you come back and, and, and talk about it. Like it was important to share your experience, but talking about mental health while mixed, I think is, is actually a big, yeah. maybe right now That's more than ever, is yeah. actually some, you know, something that we, yeah. could, we could be talking about. Like, so, like you said, it was so fun to just talk about just like, you know, being black and Asian, but how different it still is because yeah different nuances of being, you know, having like Japanese culture versus Sri Lankan culture, but Mm -hmm. it's all under that Asian umbrella. And, you know, I, I love doing that kind of stuff. Like, Oh, it's so similar, but it's so different. There's (laughs) just moments where like you, because you've gone so long without access to that story, you know, and then Mm -hmm. once you hear it, you're just like, Oh, there is, this is why borders bother me. Like I, things like that, I didn't realize why I was mm-hmm. bothered by borders or separation. It's just like, mm-hmm. well, I love our, I love my cultures. I do. I love mm-hmm. what they have to offer. But if I had known that the mm-hmm. Sri Lankan culture had this thing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that the Japanese culture had this thing, and that actually is kind of something that we could share with each other. You know, like having the yeah. access now is so is something that gives me a place to start in terms of like researching and and connecting with and maybe these types of things are the things that help break down those barriers or or yeah. you know abolish those borders in terms of the of the idea of like the how an invisible border creates an enemy out of nothing. You know, like yeah. if we actually yeah. knew each other a little bit better, we would right. wouldn't have a lot of the problem. Or I would hope we wouldn't have a lot of the problems yes. that we have. And so what I love about well, this show- It would show help is, us solve the problems a little faster if we right. had more understanding. Yeah. yeah. If agree. we could just hear each other's stories and, mm-hmm. and, and actually absorb them, mm-hmm. I think would be so meaningful. And this show has taught me, I mean, I've been doing it almost two years now and I thought I had mixedness in the bag. You know, like when I started the show, I was like, I'm mixed, I'm mixed as hell. I know exactly what it's like to be mixed. And then I start yeah. talking to other people and I'm just like, the way we access our mixedness is different. The way yeah. we're comfortable with our mixedness is different. And the, the more comfortable I have become in the last couple of years, I know that I credit it back to hearing somebody's experience and realizing what's different about their experience than, than mine. Yeah. You know, it's opened me up so much. And um, so that's a thing that I have yeah. uh, as the, the host that I'm very lucky for and grateful that I have this experience. Militantly Mix is a main hustle media podcast produced and hosted by me, Charmaine Johnson. Music is by David Bogan, The One. And if you like what you heard on Militantly Mix, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes and wherever you find your podcasts. Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.